Good morning, Crossview. Welcome to our time of gathering on Sunday morning. Hey, we're going to be singing today about how Jesus is mighty to save. We're going to be singing the song, One Thing Remains, that God's love never fails, never gives up. Uh, we're also going to sing the song, All Who Are Thirsty. Just such a reminder that when we find ourselves in those places where um, we have some way that we are in need, that God is the one who can truly quench whatever that is. And let's just enter this time uh, really focused on our love for Him, giving full worship and praise where it is due to our loving Father. kids don't forget to check out children's church right now at www.mycrossview.com crossview kids it's our last week learning about 
all the stuff in the beginning and why God always loves us. Wow, God, go now. Now, now, now. Well, good morning. Welcome to Crossview Church Online this morning. We're so thankful that you've decided to join us this morning as we turn our hearts and minds to the scripture and try to continue to learn what it means to have steady faith in difficult times. We've been in a series on the book of Daniel, looking at how Daniel and his friends survived uh, through a very difficult season of life. And today, we're going to continue as we look at, the, uh, at Daniel uh, chapter 4. Uh, and I'd like to say that there's so much in each chapter that is helpful for us uh, in these days. And even though we can't get to it all, I just want to encourage you to spend time in the scripture, read the chapter, and ask God to speak to you deeply. You know, it's been really great. We've heard uh, from many of you that the story of Daniel is incredibly helpful for what we're going through these days. Not only does it have a lot to teach us uh, as it speaks so well to our situation, but many of you are also finding it very encouraging. And I'm so thankful that God has been speaking to many of you through this series. And I anticipate that to happen again this week. In fact, I think one of our goals for this series it has been to help us walk away each week with a tool or a change of perspective or even encouragement that will help us grow through this difficult time. And we can grow through the time that we're in right now, through this difficult circumstance that we're facing. Because all of this pain without any gain would certainly be a shame. And so I'm committed to the idea that we can come out on the other side of all of this, having learned some very valuable lessons and having gained some very valuable perspectives that we might not have learned otherwise. Last week, we talked about not giving into despair, but practicing a habit of hope uh, that recognizes first that God faithfully comes through all the time and that he will continue to do that in these days. The second thing is that we were reminded of the power, that the power of much of what we face today is only of this world. And it does not compare. It is not on the same level as that of our almighty God. And so now as we turn to chapter four of Daniel, I want to talk about a choice that each of us have to make every day of our lives. In fact, this is a choice uh, that we make even multiple times a day. And, but it is a choice uh, that is made more difficult in difficult times and certainly in the midst of crisis. The choice is this. It's between response or reaction. And I heard one pastor put it uh, this last week, talk about it in this way. He called it our superpower, that we all have an ability uh, that can empower us to better handle anything that life throws at you. And he, like I said, he calls it our superpower, the respond ability. I like that. That is our ability to have measured response rather than a fear-filled reaction. This ability, as we'll see, can have a huge effect on having steady faith in difficult times. Every human person has this superpower, the ability to respond rather than to react. The challenge is that it takes work and spiritual formation, but if we can grow in this area, we'll be able to more easily handle anything that life has throws at us or has thrown at us. You have an ability to choose a response rather than to have it dictated for you. And it's this ability to choose understanding who God is and recognizing his faithfulness to us that leads to steadiness in difficult times. You see, to react to circumstances sets us up to reflect those same circumstances back into the world and the people around us. When we react, we relinquish control of our lives. But our ability to have a measured response helps us ensure steadiness in difficult times because having a measured response can help us better trust in God rather than get lost in fear. So having a measured, faith-filled response in difficult times, it can be sustaining, it can be course-reversing if we're giving in to fear, and it can be sanity-preserving. Like me and like you, Daniel faced the same choice. He didn't know what the end of the story was going to be once he was taken to Babylon. 
Daniel saw the destruction of his home, the desecration of the temple. He was forced to take a new name, uh, eat new foods, learn new languages. And time and time again, the Babylonians tried to get him to worship Babylonian gods. Yet in spite of all of these unbelievable circumstances, any one of which would just be too much, in spite of all of that, Daniel continued to respond as if God was with him. So let me ask you this question. This is a, a, a driving question for us. How would someone in your circumstances here and now, today, respond if they were absolutely confident that God was with them? I think most of us know how someone in our circumstances would react but the question is, how would someone facing your circumstances respond if they were confident that God was with them in the midst of those circumstances? Through the book of Daniel, he and his friends constantly faced this reality. Even here, we see it even here in chapter 4. In fact, when he's called upon in chapter 4, he's called upon to interpret a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. And I bet Daniel was reminded of the last time that he was called upon to do the same thing. We find it back in chapter 2. We went through this several weeks ago, but maybe you remember this. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 5. One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I have had a, a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Verse 5 says, But the king said to the astrologers, I'm serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means, you'll be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. So I wonder if in chapter 4, all of this comes to mind to Daniel, uh, and I wonder if he's tempted toward an unhelpful or a fear-filled reaction here. We find this in Daniel chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity, but one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that, I was, I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. So I issued an order calling in all of the wise men of Babylon so they could tell me what my dream meant. When all of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. At last, Daniel came in before me, and I told him the dream. He was named Belteshazzar after my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said to him, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of, the whole, of holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. Now tell me what my dream means. Now, there has been quite a lot of time uh, between chapter, the first three chapters of Daniel and chapter four. Here at the beginning of Daniel chapter four, we see that Daniel is now the chief of the sages and the magicians, it says. Most scholars believe that uh, Daniel is between 40 and 50 years old at this point. And it says that he's the wisest of all the wise men that are, that's, that, that are working for the king. So here, the king has had a dream, and he dreams of this big tree, full of life, providing for people and animals, standing in, uh, in, in, in the height of all of its glory. Then it says that the Holy One comes from heaven and says, cut it down. But not just cut down the tree, it says to lop off the branches, to shake off its leaves, to scatter its fruit, chase the wind, uh, the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches. It's a pretty thorough destruction. And this sounds like a pretty intense and frightening dream. And then the king says to Daniel, I need you to tell me what it means. So Daniel is certainly a veteran of Nebuchadnezzar's court at this point, and he's one who has interpreted dreams before, as we just saw, as we were reminded from back in chapter 2. But what's fascinating this time is that Daniel doesn't really want to answer. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar is, the, is, is not the most stable of guys, and he has this nasty habit of killing the messenger of bad news. Uh, maybe you noticed, but uh, the king didn't call Daniel in first to interpret the dreams. Now, this is just kind of a wondering, but 
um, he called in all the other wise men of Babylon first. Now the text implies that these guys weren't wise enough to interpret the dream, but maybe they're wise enough not to put themselves in danger by having to give the king some bad news. We, we don't know, but what's clear is they can't answer uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So in any case, Daniel uh, hears this dream, he's asked to interpret it, and he's frightened. And it's, he's not just a little bit scared. The text says that he's overcome. Some other translations say that he's severely distressed. What a hard situation to be in. He's frightened and scared. Are you feeling frightened? Uh, or do your circumstances that you're facing today warrant something more? Maybe you're feeling severely distressed in these days. There are these kinds of moments where we might want to say to God, God, where are you? And, and God says, I'm with you here. But God, it doesn't feel like you're with me here. It doesn't seem like you're right here with me. I can't feel it. Where are you? And I think God would say to us again and again, I'm here with you. You know, one of the things that I love about this chapter is that it's bookend with praise and recognition of God's presence and all that he's done. It recognizes that even when we don't feel like it, God is there. The chapter starts with Nebuchadnezzar himself saying this in, in verses uh, two through three. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the most high God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how powerful his wonders. His kingdom will last forever, his rule throughout all the generations. And then it ends uh, in verse 34 through 35, and then I'll read 37. It says this, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? And then at the very end, it says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven and his acts are just and true and he is able to humble the proud. I think that we can take some comfort from the book of Daniel here because even though D Daniel knew that God was with him, he was not enjoying these circumstances. He probably despised this situation, despised these circumstances just in general. He was not a superhero and he was, he, uh, he was just human and he was scared and he was not immune to pain. And so uh, I can imagine with this big sigh that he looks to the king and he says, starting in verse 19, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my Lord, and not to you. You see, Daniel's about to give him some bad news. So God gives Daniel the interpretation of this dream and it's not an easy one. Yet Daniel continues to trust God. He continues to, go, to trust God and steps into the fear with a faith-filled response instead of a fear-filled reaction. So Daniel looks at the most powerful man on the planet and he gives them the bad news about the interpretation of this dream. And we don't know, maybe Daniel's waiting in that moment for the king to just lose it like he has before and to order his death. But here in this moment, after he's done interpreting this dream, and a few verses earlier, Daniel has made it clear that this was what the Most High has declared for you, which is another challenge to the, thor to the authority of Nebuchadnezzar. And after he's done telling Nebuchadnezzar all of this, he chooses again, Daniel chooses again to respond and not react. Because when he's done interpreting the dream, he leans in and he tells the king what to do. He says, I have some advice for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. And we find this in verse 27. This is an unbelievable moment. In verse 27, it says this, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what's right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. Wow, think about a servant telling this to the king. Why is having a thoughtful and faith-filled response to the difficulties and circumstances of life so difficult? Well, I think it's because being able to have a measured, faith-filled response to difficult circumstances isn't natural. 
The response that makes uh, the most difference in a positive direction is often the response that we are least likely to choose at first. But when we're able to believe and when we're able to respond as if God is with us, we gain perspective on what's behind our circumstances in a way that we can't gain any other way. This is such a powerful reminder because Daniel is able to come to the conclusion that the reason I'm here, the reason I've gone through everything I've gone through is that God had a plan for him In his suffering, he had a plan for him. Even through all the injustice that that Daniel experienced, God had a plan. God has a plan through all of these circumstances that I would not have chosen for myself. We need to realize that uh, our, our current circumstances are a chapter, not the entire story. And how we respond here and now today matters. And we can, in fact, grow through these days that we're going through, especially as we develop the ability to choose our response rather than to react in fear. If all we do is react, not only will we not be better for it, we will never have the perspective that allows us to move successfully into our God-designed future. So don't underestimate the power of a measured, faith-filled response because it's perspective changing. This chapter ends with an example uh, of, of the king following his time where he was driven away like an animal, it says. And what happens, the way that this story ends is so incredible. We we read a bit of it before, but it says this starting in in verse 34. I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to the heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what what do you mean by these things? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and the glory uh, and glory and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. Amazing. I want to end with a a simple encouragement that comes from uh, another story of a famous interpreter of dreams. From the end of the story of Joseph uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 50. Like Daniel... Joseph's situation was difficult, but Joseph decided over and over again to have measured, faith-filled responses that led him to say these words at the end of his story. We find this in Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 through 20. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I should, that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. Joseph, like Daniel, chose measured, faith-filled responses, not fear-filled reactions that gave him the perspective to see an opportunity for growth and for good. God's intention became reality through Joseph and Daniel's unprecedented, circumstance-defying, faith-filled responses. Often these types of faith-filled measured responses don't seem all that significant at the time. But if you put it all together, Daniel's choices over and over, Joseph's choices over and over led to Jesus and the unfolding story of my redemption and yours. Now it's our turn in these unprecedented, difficult, and trying times to respond in a way that helps bring about God's intention for our day and our time. We don't always get to choose the circumstance that we face. Rarely do we get to choose the circumstance that we face, but we do get to choose how we face it, how we will respond. Will we respond with the idea that God is with us? And as we walk through these days with that perspective, we can practice a measured, faith-filled response to the circumstances around us, reflecting not fear, but steadiness in difficult times. I hope that's something that you want because it's something that I want. We can do it together.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful. Again, I'm so thankful for uh, the example of Daniel, that Daniel continues to respond uh, in measured and faith-filled ways as we read his story. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, react out of fear uh, or, or being overwhelmed, but he is able to, uh, to respond faith-filled, trusting you. And so, God, we have that opportunity in these days to choose how we're going to respond to these circumstances. And by choosing how we respond to these circumstances, we will reflect either fear or we will reflect the light, the love, the hope, and the purpose that we experience in and through you. That's what I want. So help us in these days where it's difficult to do so. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory, Jesus. And in your name we pray. Amen. Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial change. One thing remains. One thing remains. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, Never runs out on me. Your love. On and on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid. One thing. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid, there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love
Steve. 